Got the Elks? Mm -hmm. That's my fault. I don't have it with me either. Everyone, yeah. welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us and, uh, and or watching us. Let's um, get the meeting started. We have a, a number of business items tonight. We'll start with um, the invocation and the pledge, if you will. Councilman Blaylock. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come together tonight, give us the wisdom to make the decisions that are in the best interest of our town. And bless those that are in need now and need our help. And also, please, Lord, bless the world. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, sir. So begin tonight with presentations. We have two. The first, uh, Matt, please, if you'll introduce... Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, Town <coughs> Council. Uh, as you all are well aware, uh, the town was granted, was awarded a grant from the North Carolina Forestry Service to have a tree canopy assessment performed. Uh, you have a copy of that uh, report in your agenda packet. Uh, that uh, report and the assessment is performed by Planet Geo. Uh, we have Andy Evans here from Planet Geo to uh, cover and present those findings to you tonight. So I'll go ahead and, and turn it over to Andy. Thank you, members of council, and thank you for having me here tonight. It's always fun to uh, get to see the communities uh, with my boots on the ground that we work on and get to experience it firsthand, so thank you. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and open up a uh, presentation tonight just with an agenda of what I'm gonna talk about. Um, we wanna go over the purpose of uh, why we would do a canopy assessment. Uh, we're gonna talk about the methods that Planet Geo used to develop the data that I'm presenting to you tonight. And then we're gonna talk quickly about some key findings from your guys' assessment. Um, but keep in mind that these key findings are very limited, very generalized. Uh, it would take hours to go over every single detail of the assessment. There's a lot of information that's involved with these. So um, we will hit some of the highlights and generalizations there. And then I wanna talk to you guys about what you can do with the data as well after that. And uh, hopefully spark some discussion, maybe some questions as we go on. So hopefully that'll take about 15 minutes or so, and then I wanna leave plenty of time for Q&A afterwards if you guys have <laughs> uh, questions while I go through this. Um, I'm gonna be moving pretty fast. Feel free to write them down and uh, ask me at the end of the presentation. So just quickly, my name is Andy Evans. Uh, like Matt said, I'm the GIS manager with Planet Geo, so I oversee all the canopy assessments. We have Morgan Garner and Hannah Gregory who also participated in this assessment. I just wanted to introduce them. They did a lot of work and poured uh, a lot of uh, sweat and tears into a lot of the assessments that they do. So I wanted to go ahead and recognize them really quick. But um, I'm gonna go ahead and get into why uh, we would want to do a canopy assessment. Um, I won't read the, the quote verbatim on the screen, but what I want you guys to, to see is that a canopy assessment develops data that's, that can be used as a preliminary tool so that you guys can make planning decisions going into the future. What that planning, those planning decisions look like and what that path looks like is different for every community. And um, we're gonna talk about some generalized paths that you can take <coughs> with the data and what you can do with it here in just a little bit. Um, but I wanted to emphasize that uh, in the whole planning <coughs> cycle that you see here on your screen, of what do we have, what do we want, how do we get what we want, and how are we doing, this canopy assessment fits into the first part. We're really doing a resource assessment for you guys. We wanna see what resources you have to work with to move forward. Um, so that's what we're doing, and that feeds into the whole planning process um, that you guys can take part in after this assessment is complete. And again, um, we all probably know a lot of the benefits of trees, but this canopy assessment helps to quantify those benefits. There are some uh, quantifiable benefits in the report, um, but I just wanna stress that 
The canopy in your town helps to reduce stress, it helps to save energy, it raises property values, protects uh, wildlife and ecosystems, and it boosts the economy as well. There's lots and lots of research to back up that information. So I'm gonna transition now to how we did the canopy assessment. Um, I want you guys to have a little bit of context before you see some of the results, and I'm sure you've seen the report already, but I want you guys to know what goes into making a canopy assessment. Um, at least with uh, the Planet Geo uh, recipe. Most, uh, most canopy assessments are done in similar ways using remote sensing GIS technology, um, but Planet Geo uh, does things just a little bit differently, and I'll talk about that here in just a minute. So one of the first steps is obtaining the source imagery. We base all of our data on uh, overhead aerial imagery. We, for this assessment, uh, it was based on 2022 and 2014 NAEP imagery. We did a change assessment using those two years. We also then take that imagery and we classify it into different types of land cover, whether it's canopy or shrub or sand or, um, or vegetation. Then step three, we really wanna help you guys locate plantable area in the town and we want you to quantify how much tree canopy you have versus how much plantable space you have versus how much impervious surface you have. So that's step three. And then step four, we take that, the two sets of data in number two and three and we summarize it into different assessment scales um, that I'll show you here in just a minute. And then we take uh, that data and we report the findings and interpret it for you guys. So this is kind of what the, the source imagery looks like from 2022. We take this information and the next step, the next thing we need to do is turn it into something that classifies it into uh, one of these six categories. And the way we do that right now is we do not do our own internal classification, but we use a partner uh, who is closely tied with us called Earth Define, who uses an AI-based model to, to really accurately pull out all these classes that you see. And once we do that, excuse me, we end up with a raster, which is really an image full of uh, millions of pixels um, that looks like the image on the right. And that, hat, that represents one of every of the six classifications that was on the previous screen. Once we do that, this is step three. We wanna turn that into usable data for you guys to develop planting plans and know where plantable space is and also know where your unsuitable areas are so that you can uh, develop policies, ordinances, and uh, management strategies that help to improve your, your, or your urban forest. Once we take those two data sets, the planting areas and the land cover, we combine it and we run metrics on those to, to give you acreages and percentages by all the different geographies that were part of this assessment. Those geographies are uh, town, the town boundary, the zoning types in the town, census block groups, public property, and we also did parcels. I don't show parcels on here just because it's a very complex data set. Um, but those are the five areas, the five assessment scales that we looked at canopy and plantable space for you guys. And now I'm gonna jump in, uh, that's, that's a little bit about how we do the assessment. I'm gonna go ahead and jump into some of the key findings, both for the overall town numbers and for each individual assessment scale. So if you look at this first slide, this is the, the biggest view that we can take of your land cover. When we do that first step and we convert the imagery into land cover, this is what we end up with. We, up, we end up with these metrics. As you can see, the tree canopy uh, is about 56% if you count tree canopy over impervious as well. And then there's about 21% of other vegetation and 2% shrub. If you notice, there's a difference between tree canopy potential, I'm sorry, urban tree canopy and uh, land cover. Tree canopy here is about 56%, tree canopy here is about 59%. And the reason that is, is because this metric here that I'm showing you is based on just land area. So we remove all water bodies from the denominator when we're calculating percentages for this metric. And the reason for that is, is because the water bodies are never really useful for tree planting in the first place. So um, 
what I want to point out here is you have 59% uh, townwide tree canopy cover. That's an increase of 9% since 2014. And we have 23% possible planting area over the whole town. And 18% of that was unsuitable for planting. I also want to point out that if you add the 59%, the tree canopy and the possible planting area, you end up with a roughly 82% theoretical maximum of your tree canopy. So this, this number can be used to kind of set goals and develop strategies going forward. So getting into the data from the target geographies or what we call assessment scales, the zoning scale. In general, we saw that residential areas had more tree canopy and more plantable space and also less impervious surface than commercial areas. We also saw that low density areas, whether that be residential or commercial, uh, outperformed when compared to higher density areas. Also lower density areas grew canopy and higher densities lost canopy. That's a pretty typical uh, layout of how we see tree, tree canopy assessments um, play out in, in most cities. And the reason for that is because there's simply more plantable space with uh, lower density developments and uh, the same goes with residential versus commercial or industrial. When we look at census block groups, with, which are just uh, groups of land that are uh, blocked into areas of e roughly equal population, we can see that tree canopy ranged in these areas from 9% to 86%. Uh, the highest being in the inland areas that are relatively undeveloped. Uh, possible planting area ranged from 7% to 58%. Canopy change ranged from all the way from negative 10% to 31%, depending on the area. And if you look at this breakdown, um, obviously the areas, uh, the graphic, I'm sorry, the graphic on the left is tree canopy. The graphic on the right is tree canopy change. So if you notice, uh, tree canopy on the inland area is very high. It also grew quite a bit over the last, uh, over the, the nine year period. As well uh, on the, the island area, tree canopies was relatively lower and most areas declined to some certain extent. It's important to point out though that this assessment does not directly find out what the source of the canopy change is. It can be one of many reasons. It can be due to uh, natural disasters, hurricanes, it can be from development, or it can be a combination of all that. Um, and if you notice, if we break down, this is going back to the last slide, if we break down the, in, the inland areas versus the island areas, the island had about 31% tree canopy, while the inland areas had about 84%. And if, you, if we're looking at the 31% number on the island, I would say that's pretty typical to other communities that are similar to you guys in North Carolina, uh, similar to Kill Devil Hills. Uh, they had about a 32% tree canopy cover uh, during the same time period. The public property area, this was a, um, a geography that assessed all public properties or all properties owned uh, publicly. All areas, uh, all these areas averaged about 12% tree canopy. That's significantly less than town average, but keep in mind that a lot of these areas are probably part of the tidal area where trees don't naturally grow anyway. Um, there's also 80% possible planting area, which could represent an opportunity, but it could also be the fact that these, uh, the vegetation in these tidal areas is also skewing the numbers just a little bit too. So keep that in mind. Um, in these areas though, there is other good news. Canopy increased by about 24 acres total, or it's a 2% it's a raw gain or a 26% relative gain, which relative just means compared to how much canopy we had at, during 2014, it increased by 26% in 2022. And the last was parcels. There were 12,607 parcels analyzed. 88% um, of those parcels met or exceeded the townwide average of 59%, but keep in mind that this does include both inland and island properties. 
the third bullet point, I apologize, there's a, there's a typo there. It says about 10,900 parcels were entirely covered. That's not true, it's 10,900 parcels were at least partially covered by canopy. Well, 1,400 had no canopy. I apologize for that. Um, but this, this parcels layer sometimes is difficult for us to report on in our reports and in this kind of format, but where you're gonna get the most use out of that data is when, our, when all this data is populated into the state's canopy app that we have. Um, within the next few weeks, there will be, the data will be online and interactive for you guys to look at. You can zoom in to the parcels, you can visualize tree canopy change by parcel, and this is a really powerful tool to see parcel by parcel what, where canopy was lost, and you guys can start painting a picture in your minds of what is causing the canopy loss. Sometimes you can see because it's development, or sometimes you could see it was, there was just a tree removed for some unknown reason. So this is, this is my last slide that I'm gonna conclude on before we do questions. Um, but I wanted to have a discussion and get you guys thinking about what this data can be used for and what the next steps are. Um, a lot of times communities, especially communities in this grant program through the state, get this data and they don't really know what to do with it. But I wanted to highlight some things you can do with it and some other cities have done with it. The first and primary thing that most cities do and the most effective thing is you can set a town-wide and more specific tree canopy goals. And what I mean by that is we can have a town-wide number, but you can also do something where you take uh, the zoning types and you can set a tree canopy goal for each zoning type. Or you can do so with a different geography as well, whether it's census block groups or something else. And that gives everybody a, a metric to work towards and a metric to uh, measure yourself against in the future if you were to do another canopy assessment to to check and see how you're doing. Obviously, the next two are informed zoning policies and preservation policies. That's, that's a big ticket item. You can obviously pinpoint the areas that are, um, that are performing better and the areas that might need attention through policy changes or ordinance changes. You can also use the data to drive resource allocation, whether it be uh, town-sponsored uh, preservation activities on public land or tree planting efforts and so on. Uh, you can really target your efforts so that you're getting the most bang, bang for your buck on those properties. In addition, um, and this is one of the things that I think is really important for most communities to do in some form or fashion, whether you do it internally through us or through another company, but develop an urban forestry management plan that's one thing you can do to really utilize this data and put it to work for you. Urban forestry management plans will incorporate all resources that the city has, all uh, public sentiments, uh, administrative sentiments, um, and as well as uh, by council. Um, we want to, through those plans, you can really look and uh, establish a holistic guide to develop your uh, management efforts of your urban forest. And then lastly, um, I encourage everyone who gets these assessments to not stop here. Um, two data points, 2014 and 2022, are good, um, but it's always better to have three. Um, it's always better to, to, to see how you're doing and to really solidify those trends and you get a better picture of how your canopy is growing or not growing or, or declining in certain areas um, through time. So you can do that by uh, either getting another canopy assessment done by us, doing in-house GIS work, or you can, um, you can even uh, subscribe to our TP Canopy app, which gives you uh, automatic updates every two years to your canopy numbers. So um, those are some things you can do with the numbers, and um, I'll conclude there. Um, I want to hear what questions you guys have, and I want to know how I can try to dial in on that. Council. Well, I just, want, I just want to say appreciate what you've done. Really, really helps me understand better. Um, is the is the um, type of tree addressed in the the what the the composition like the species composition? Yeah. No, um, that's not currently something that can really be done accurately 
using remote sensing techniques, you'd have to really do sampling and inventory on the ground to, yeah. to assess something like that. And I, I will speak to that really quick. A lot of communities are concerned that uh, part of their canopy is made up of invasive species. And so canopy assessments don't always determine the quality of the forest, but they will tell you the quantity. They also won't tell you whether or not some of the, some of the canopy that we're measuring is our, our invasive vines or something that have grown up dead trees, things that like that. That was my concern. We, we made a mistake years ago when we put the Bartlett pears along the street yeah. out there. Yep. So I just wanted to make sure we address that in the process. Yep, that's definitely a consideration. Well, that, thank you, first of all, for Welcome. conducting such a scientific <coughs> look at it. Uh, we have been struggling to preserve trees. We've had various attempts which have been partially successful. In some senses, we've managed to annoy everyone on both sides of the issue. But what I take away from your presentation and your report, and again, thank you for the thoroughness, is that if you look at the aggregated view, you're comforted because you're deal it's skewed by all of the mainland land. If you look at the disaggregated view, it's alarming, right? We see all those negative numbers in brown. And a number of our citizens have already pointed that out, and thank you for doing that, Mr. Dudley, et cetera. So good news, bad news. Uh, one of the things that you recommend beyond the management plan is an outreach to the public to encourage um, homeowners and residents to preserve trees. Can you be a little bit more specific about what, do, do you have a plan that you prefer? What are the dimensions of that plan? For, for reaching out to the public? Correct. Um, I, think it, I think it depends on, I think it really depends on your community. I think it depends on what modes you have available to you to do that. Um, and um, I don't have any specific recommendations in that regard. I will say that when we do management plans, um, a lot of times there is a public outreach component um, where we will specifically uh, have a segment of that, that plan where we uh, target through social media, through uh, public um, hearings, through uh, other, um, other events and things like that. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate your wanting to tailor it to the community. Um, what I'm driving at is that it seems to me there are two separate policy directions that you could take here. One is you can restrict the rights of property owners with respect to removal of trees. The other is you can incentivize more planning or you can try to thread the needle down the middle of that. Uh, I'm just wondering whether, I'm wondering where, where you've had the greatest success in terms of public outreach because public outreach is one of those hidden issues. If you have landowners who don't care about trees, or want them removed, or don't want to plant them, it intensifies this problem. And it really exacerbates it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Typically, the, the tree canopy assessments that we do, like I said, they don't get into that level of detail with recommendations. So I can't speak from how I have dealt with this question in the past. There are other people in our company who would be able to give you some ideas in that regard. Um, I think that from what I have seen in my experience in other positions uh, with municipalities is that um, it's usually a combination of both. It's a combination of being restrictive on development and redevelopment, and it's a combination of incentivizing. Um, many communities do things like grant programs uh, for both maintenance and planting, um, and some some communities do stormwater credits during developments. Some, uh, there's a lot of creative ways you can go about doing that. But ap actually establishing some of those ideas is, wasn't under the scope of this, this project. I understand, and I, I appreciate your deviating a bit from sure. what you do. Of course. Um, so as I look at this data, I'm not comforted. I'm, I'm alarmed because a large tract of the mainland was scheduled for development, um, that is stalled, but ultimately much of that is going to be developed. These numbers are going to flip radically in five to 10 years is my sense of it. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about a management plan that incentivizes homeowners, when you talk about 
uh, management tools that um, enable us to shape development, that, that's really critical. That, that is the, the nexus of the problem we're facing. So these numbers look good when you aggregate them, but down the road, it's extremely problematic, right? Just, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you my takeaway. You don't have to agree with me. That's, that's, my, that's my sense yeah. of where this is. I was is. just wondering if I should respond. <laughs> no, no. I'm just, I mean, I'm, I'm reminded of what Disraeli said. I hate <clears throat> three things, lies, lies, and statistics. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you look at these statistics and you say, oh, wow, that's great. The forest is regenerating but until they tear it down. Mm -hmm. So I think we have a problem and we need to deal with it. It's my takeaway. And thank you for your work. I'm, sure, I'm, of course. Uh, if I may, mm -hmm. and I know you just deliver the facts and we try to come up with the opinions. <laughs> uh, am I supposed to be happy or sad with a 9% gain in eight years on the mainland and 176 acres lost in eight years? Is, am I supposed to be happy or sad? Um, it depends on how you look at it. Um, <laughs> I would say from, from my perspective, uh, being in the industry, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not overly alarmed. I think there's good news that the, 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 the mainland areas are growing so quickly. There's opportunities for future preservation because of that. Um, and that's something that probably you would really want to focus on as development does start to come in to those parts of the community. The, the good part about that ecosystem in the mainland is that trees obviously grow quickly, left to themselves. So if you create space, uh, reduce plantable space, or reduce uh, impervious, unsuitable space, trees will naturally come in, whether homeowners plant them or whether it's required in your development ordinances. Um, I also will add that while it looks bad on the island, uh, with 10% losses in a lot of census block groups. Um, we don't know exactly why those losses are there. We don't know if it's because of uh, a hurricane in 2018. We don't, I don't know how many trees were lost during that. I don't know, we don't, this assessment doesn't really factor that in. It could be from development and it could be from natural disasters. So whether your guys' local knowledge and whatever data you may have to determine how much um, how many trees were lost because of that can help color that data point um, to make decisions going forward. And like I said, that's why a third data point <laughs> is always a good thing. Um, you may not see such large losses uh, if you were to do an assessment as soon as new data is available, um, say in 2024 or 2025. If I can point out, we're roughly doing 250 new house permits annually uh, and that's about to become exhausted uh you said kill devil kill devil hills mm -hmm. uh, us being a proactive growing town 250 new permits a year does that keep us in the normal range uh because i think our nine nine percent would be due to 250 new housing permits it's, it, it's hard to say. Yeah, I, I don't know. And you do agree, and, and I'm, I'm agreeing with you. I'm not trying to challenge you. Uh, the off-island numbers distort uh, our canopy because there's 80-some percent canopy off the island. Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what brings it up to 59 percent, yeah. And Councilman Blaylock asked you, and, I, and I'll ask you again, because I did read in here somewhere where you did say there are some types of preferred trees that you would recommend. Uh, can you recommend some? Um, I wouldn't take that step at this point. The, the point in the report was that there are, that the, the types of trees, there are types of trees that are available to use in this type of ecosystem. Um, it wasn't really within the scope of the project to try to make specific recommendations of trees. Okay. Lastly, and that's always a nice word to <laughs> say when someone's being asked questions, uh, and you probably didn't delve into this, so you, you may not have an opinion, but do you feel if our ordinances uh, effectively preserved or, or hindered our canopy? 
I, I can't answer that. I thought so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Sheila, Mark? Thank you for the study um, and the explanation. I think it's very helpful. When I look at the map of the island, um, I think alarmed might be an overstatement, but there's certainly room for concern. Mm -hmm. um, we see increased in uh, stormwater issues, even from property to property that didn't previously exist. Um, erosion continues. Um, and of course, we know the benefit of trees. And I think what I hear in between the lines is native trees would be an appropriate uh, path to promote for whatever the ecosystem would be? It definitely can be. Yeah, I, I wouldn't, um, from my previous life as an urban forester, <laughs> I wouldn't limit myself to, uh, to, to native trees specifically just because um, there are a lot of limitations on, on what you can plant in urban environments. And if you limit yourself to native trees, you're really reducing the diversity that you could possibly bring in in species. Uh, so even though non-native species can sometimes be invasive, I would stay away from those, but non-native species aren't always bad. That means include palm trees, Charlie. I was just, <laughs> no, gonna, I was just ready to comment on that. <laughs> Doggone palm trees. <laughs> no, that's an interesting, um, that's an interesting comment because I think we've really strived, or at least those working on the ordinances have strived uh, to at least zero in on mm -hmm. native, mm -hmm. um, native trees. And you're saying that we maybe should broaden that a bit for other trees that do well but are, are not in the invasive category. Yes, I mean, I... I in gener generally speaking, I, I don't have a whole lot of local knowledge about um, tree, tree species that are more native to your area. Um, in the Midwest, I, I have a good grasp on that, and that's what I would say in our location. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, I do know that I, I wouldn't want to limit myself to just native trees. Um, native, native plantings in general are a good, that's a good place to start when you're looking for uh, tree species to include in your in your recommended planting lists or your required planting lists, but I wouldn't just stop there. I would I would take it a step further and, and really scrutinize which non-native species are good and which ones are not good. Thank you very much. It's a very enlightening study. Thank you, Matt, for making this possible okay. and thank you, sir, for your for your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you ask what the administration intends to do in terms of applying this data to our tree canopy on and off the island? Um, yes, sir. Uh, talk to Madam a little bit about this today. Um, right now, the planning board will be going to receive this. I think their meeting's this Thursday. Um, they'll have a chance to be able to review this and see what actually came out of the study on this. Um, they had looked at the uh, uh, tree ordinance. They have a tree ordinance that they've looked at. Uh, they may you may give them direction to review this and bring something back for you to be able to look at this. Uh, like you said, the development on the other side has sort of at pause to right this moment, uh, so we'll be able to take a look at that going forward. Um, but I believe uh, the next steps is for us to determine what we would like to do with this study. Uh, if we want to go further with them to look at other ways that we could maybe add another element to this uh, study going forward. Uh, or take it back to the planning board and let them start to look at it within the ordinances that we already have. Yeah, and I would say, um, well, that first of all, I think it should be reconsidered by the planning board in light of new data. But I, I think the other takeaway I have is that we should consider establishing goals and we should get an additional data point so we actually continue to monitor the degree to which the can tree canopy is preserved or increases or Sadly, it may be decreasing, but we don't know if we don't yes. measure. And it's all about measurement and goals. So, thank you. Um, David, the, there's always the property that the town administers. Yes, ma'am. Versus um, the homeowners. 
So do you imagine that the town might develop a plan for the public spaces that that exist in terms of? Yes, I do. Um, Rick's already looked at some of these things. We, what we've had to do is go back and look at uh, the utilities that we have, uh, where they're located at, because we don't want to um, set trees on top of the utility lines and then 10 years people go, why did they put a tree here and the roots are now into the sewer system? Uh, but those are things we're going to have to weigh out as well going through. Uh, parks and things that we have like that that don't have areas that are open space for events like Milton Park. Uh, we can always go back and look about putting a tree here and there in those. Uh, right now, Rick's going out. Um, he has staff going out labeling our trees and identifying our trees. Now we're tagging the trees so we can be able to bring back uh, actually where our trees are on our town property. Uh, so we'll be able to lock that into our uh, GIS as well so we can pull that up. Uh, so I think we're doing some things to identify areas, <coughs> excuse me, uh, that we currently have. And then there's areas that they've already planted some at Bill Smith Park around the perimeter and there's other areas that we can plant out there. Um, we'd also have uh, pine trees that we grow out there at Bill Smith Park um, to the right. Uh, so there's areas there we can look at plantings and maybe harvesting trees there as well. Uh, so Rick's been looking at a few options to bring back uh, during the budget cycle. Excellent, thank you for that. Yes ma'am. There are no other questions or comments. Let's move to the second presentation. Um, the paid parking program, Jim. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Mayor, Council, and uh, town staff, public. For those of you who don't know me, I am Jim Barr. I manage the uh, Auto Connect organization for paid parking, one of your favorite topics. Um, <clears throat> Jim, could you speak up just a tad, please? Sorry? Just Speak up just a tad, please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, trying to make sure I get into the mic here. Uh, also, got to make sure I understand the remote. Here we go. Uh, I'm going to go through the revenue citations, statistics, and some of the information that I know council and staff was very interested in uh, at the beginning of the year. Um, from a parking management standpoint, I'm not going to say that this year was not without challenges. Uh, we certainly had our challenges. Um, and except for the grandfather decal program, nothing was really unique or a problem that we have not experienced in the past or couldn't deal with. So it was really just a, managed, a process that we had to go through in particular for the residents, the grandfather decal program, making sure that we could easily incorporate the new requirements for resident permits in the current year. Now that that's done, uh, we see a lot e smoother path for next year um, because resident counts are already set up, resident vehicles are already in our system, and we can just move forward with new permits for the coming year. So jumping into the topics, starting with parking revenue, um, we did well this year. We, we logged nearly 150,000 parked vehicles in the town of Oak Island over the summer with a total net revenue of over $1.1 million that we delivered to the town. So that is your money. Um, from a trend standpoint, March obviously was a big month, largely because, solely because, of the season visitor permits that we sold in the middle of March. The rest of the year is just a normal bell curve. Um, July obviously being the big one. Uh, you see a little bit done in October. There was no paid parking in October but we still received um, citation fine payments. And we're still seeing those as we'll tend through the rest of the year. <clears throat> so from a revenue standpoint, a very good year for the town. The permit drivers, um, 
The big one, obviously, is day permits and the upgrades to a day permit. People who came and just spent the day, or they came and parked for a couple hours and said, man, this is a beautiful day, I'm just gonna pay for the other two hours and it gives me a whole day. Um, so over $600,000 just for those types of permits. Season visitors, uh, next big one, two hour, three hour, <clears throat> and then at the bottom, the residents uh, brought in $91,000. Violation of pavements, <clears throat> excuse me, that's why I have water. Um, the rates depended on when you paid for your parking or the type of violation. So if you parked in a paid parking spot but didn't pay for your permit, you could pay the same day rate of $25 for your fine. If you didn't do that and fell over to the next day, it was 50. Other violations, parking in the right of way, parking anywhere else, any other violation was a $50 fine. So those are the standard um, fine rates of 93,000, which would have been the $50 rates same day parking rate violation for 25 brought in 51,000. Uh, and then we had a couple of the specials. Uh, specials are things like parking in front of a fire hydrant. Uh, <clears throat> something that really presented a, a safety issue or parking blocking um, the emergency beach access. And we had a couple of those that we had to deal with this year. Resident permits. Uh, as I started, we had, this was our challenge. Um, 4,922 accounts, 8,137 permits were transferred to us from the town when we started the year. Um, <clears throat> and through the course of the year, we sold another 9,142. So quite a few others. The biggest challenge that we had that we did not recognize early in the year was we didn't get them all. We knew there was a risk to that, either from records, transfer to us, whatever the case may be. Um, and early in the season, we just gave tickets to people that didn't have a permit on their license plate even if they had a decal in their car. And after about a month of that, we started recognizing that there was a lot of them. And we stopped. At that point in time, we started capturing all of those vehicles that had a permit that were not already in our system. And we manually added them into our system. Gave all of those people the benefit of the doubt that they should have had a permit for the current year. That ended up being about 1,300. By the time we got to the end of July, uh, we were double and triple counting those, and we just stopped. And we said, look, if people have a decal in their windshield, we're gonna treat them as if they were good. So all in all, um, that problem settled out fairly quickly once we got into the June timeframe. Total resident permits ended up being 18,583. Citation report, um, and I apologize to the crowd, the numbers are small, because there's a lot of them. Um, <clears throat> the big dog here is parking without a valid permit in a paid parking space. That was 3,677 violations, citations that we wrote throughout the summer. The next biggest one was parking in what we call a no zone um, space. It's not a valid parking zone. So example, primary example is the right of way. Um, that was 2000 and something up there. Um, the next biggest one was a surprise. And the surprise is it was so low. And that is parking in a space reserved for Oak Island residents without a ro an Oak Island resident permit it was only 300. 
we knew up front that that was going to be a big concern and we expected a much higher number. And we were very pleased that either with the signage or education, that this really did not become a problem. So that the spaces reserved for Oak Island residents were generally available for Oak Island residents and not used by somebody else. The rest of the violations per the ordinances um, are fairly typical. The last one, parking phasing oppo opposing traffic. Um, this one started becoming a problem and in the middle of the year, um, Mr. Kelly uh, informed us of new state legislation uh, that limited the fine associated with certain parking permits. And our system was not set up to handle that change. And the change is reflected in, if somebody paid to park in a spot and it's a valid space, but they parked oppos opposing traffic, it's a violation, but I can only charge them the difference between what they paid and the $50. Uh, so we are now implementing that change for the coming year. And it's really, I guess, from my point of view and, and our legal staff, um, there's a little gray area here. Uh, out of an abundance of caution, we're just going ahead and making this change so that going forward, we can clearly, with peace of mind, say, if somebody's doing that, we're citing them properly. Uh, parked versus violation trends. Um, so as I said, we had about 147,000, 148,000 registered or recorded vehicles. Uh, residents was 32,000, um, visitors 115,000. Normal bell curve for um, number of parked vehicles, April peaking in July and coming back down through to September. And the little numbers across the bottom are the percentage of violations versus number of parked vehicles. Um, we strive to get to 3%. Uh, and that's through signage, education, helping customers, anything that we can do to help reduce the, the violation rate. Um, typically, in the first year of paid parking, we never get close. We're lucky if we get to 5%. One town I have worked with is at eight, which is really a challenge. Now, granted, a couple years in, they're doing much better than that. We felt really, really good um, as we saw this steadily decline from May 5.3%, uh, June 4.3%, July 36 and August 3.1%. That's where we really expected to see the trend in the second year. So to have that kind of violation rate in the first year really reflected a lot of efforts by the town, by us, with signs, et cetera, to make sure that people are aware that they need to pay for their parking. September, always a problem. We always see an uptick. Every town that we deal with, um, here in Southeast North Carolina, we get a whole new set of people coming in in September. Kids are gone back to school, and everybody else that has no kids comes to the beach. So we see an uptick. Um, and true to form, we were right on target with about 4.5%. Not a surprise. Overall for the year, 4% violation rate based on parked vehicles that we captured. That's good. I was very, very pleased with that. Resident versus parking. Um, the top bar represents the trend for residents and the table says that on average, 174 residents per day parked at the beach. We had a peak of 536 in September 
514, uh, 477. These are individual days. Okay, pick a day, 4th of July. Memorial Day this year was a washout. Forget that. Second week in June, biggest day ever. First good holiday or good weekend day that we had on Saturday. It was just huge. And you can see the little pike up there. Um, similar numbers for visitors. Average 627 per day with a peak of 1,686. Now somebody's going to ask, well, how many parking spaces are in the town? Um, I believe at the last count it was somewhere around 1,400. Um, so, give or take. So yeah, we count cars come and go, we catch them. You know, and we count them. Um, people come and park for two hours, they buy a permit, we count it. Somebody else uses that spot, buys a permit for two hours, that's the second count. So we park a number of cars. Um, somebody else would ask, well, Jim, how do you know really how many cars were there? Number of permits that we sell are the easy ones. And then the second count is the number of permit or number of vehicles that we scan that have a season permit or don't have a permit at all. Do we get 100%? No, never. Can't be done. Not in my book. Um, but this is a really good approximation of exactly what's going on in the, in the town. <laughs> so, to net that out, <clears throat> what we're looking at on average is about 20% of the people that park at the beach are residents. You're looking at about 80% of the people that park at the beach are your visitors. Violation payment rate. Uh, this gives a breakdown of you know, how many people have paid for their citations. Um, bottom line, 79% of the people who received the citation have paid their violation. Um, again, this is good. Um, from an industry standpoint, most companies consider 70, 75% as good, as excellent. And we're starting the first year at 79%. Most of the towns I deal with are in the low 80s, second year, third year. Uh, for first year, 79% is very good. 21% that's left over, those are either at or on their way to collections. Zip code distribution. Um, I know the town in particular was very interested in where are people coming from. Um, what's what's the attraction? Where you know, and this could play into the marketing of Oak Island. This could play into how you get the message out. But this was very interested, and it's the reason why you had to enter your zip code when you bought your parking permit. Uh, so the big dogs here, uh, Northeastern North Carolina was the biggest one at 25%. Second largest area, Brunswick County at 21%. And then the south and west of North Carolina at 18%. The rest of them quickly fall it down into single digits by states. There isn't other states in there um, at 2%, the ones that really just didn't count. The bottom line was 64% of the people that parked here are from North Carolina. So it's, you can see the demographic very simply being people in this state stay in the state and come and enjoy the beach. Specials. Um, one of our typical challenges is making sure that we are covering the people classified as residents or classified under other categories per the town requirements and make sure that they have parking permits. 
Uh, so starting off with, I've already talked about the decals that were not transferred that we picked up. Um, it was 1,304. Fishing season permits, got a parking permit. Uh, one, uh, one vehicle's worth, those were 80. We had 140 resident property owners that did not have a building on their lot that were entitled to a resident permit. That's a full three car option. We had 140 of those issued. Uh, and then we had the pier, um, restaurant staffs, uh, Coco's, uh, Coco Cabana and Ruby staff, 67 and seven respectively. The other properties that we log here uh, are the properties that do not have a utility bill within the town of Oak Island for their individual property or rental. Uh, so we go out of our way to work with each one of those property managers to give them special codes so that those residents can register for their parking. At the beginning of the season, we met with the restaurant folks at the pier and Mr. Kelly and I spent several meetings trying to come, come up with a way of allowing people to go to the park at the pier and use the restaurant without fear of, you know, reducing traffic for the restaurants just because there's paid parking. We issued discount coupons for the restaurants to pass out to their customers. <clears throat> Those coupons, depending on the restaurant and the fishing pier activity, were good for future parking of one or two hours. We passed out a lot. They passed out a lot, but almost nobody used them. This was a huge effort with no return, uh, simply put. Um, so our recommendation is we need to change this peer a lot in the future, and it comes down to two options. One is either everybody always pays for the parking or we set up a program where there's two hours of free parking uh, within the peer lot itself. We have run a beta program, a trial program with the town's agreement uh, where we've placed sensors in each of the parking spaces um, in the pier parking lot that can tell us when a car comes and when a car leaves. And we can monitor when they've hit their two hour limit. Um, that is a very simple thing to do. Uh, it is very effective. Uh, the company that we use for the sensors is called 11X based out of uh, Ontario. Um, and they have, we have already demonstrated that we can easily use that system to monitor for a two hour parking capability within that pier lot, just because it is so unique. So that is something for consideration for next year. Communications. Um, yeah, we got a lot of phone calls. We got a lot of emails. We had a lot of visitors downstairs to the office. Uh, we got to the point where the traffic was low enough at, downstairs at the office, so we, we discontinued that at the end of July. But the use of the office was primarily to set up parking permits for residents, some Q's and A's, a couple um, <coughs> citations, and then a smattering of everything else. Uh, phone, um, very consistent with the first year of service. Um, I think somebody asked me at some point how many phone calls we actually had. Uh, we had something on the order of 10,000 phone calls. But that's my company, not Oak Island. That's everybody, every town. Now, what's the predominant number of phone calls that we got from? Oak Island, because it's the first year. Um, why did we get calls? Well, the number one issue was I paid for my parking and I got a ticket anyway. Go through, go through, go through. Yep, you typed in an eight instead of a nine on your license plate. Sorry, um, but we can fix that for you and 
take the citation off, no problem. Those kinds of problems we can fix in a matter of seconds. Uh, about 20% of the calls were purchasing a permit. People that don't want to use an app, don't have a smartphone, whatever. Uh, and this is the primary reason why we have the phone service. Because we know from a geographic standpoint and demographic standpoint, not everybody has a cell phone. Not everybody wants to use an app. They can call us to get a permit in a matter of seconds. Um, 14% for paying a citation. <clears throat> and then we have some general disputes. Um, people that just don't like to pay to, for parking. People uh, that said, hey, I always parked here. Uh, people said, that's not in front of a driveway. Here's your picture. Um, those always got referred to an email review process. Uh, we've got a three-stage process uh, with a final stage being now coming to me directly. Um, and then we got to always have the number of Q's and A's. Emails, um, similar. Uh, we had about three or 4,000 emails come through generally. It was, again, disputes caused by license plate typos. Um, again, easy to fix. Then general disputes that we submitted for investigation, 15%. Um, I'll make one comment uh, in, in comparison to uh, your neighbor Holden Beach. Um, these numbers, the percentages, um, are not unlike what we went through last year with Holden. This year Holden represented about 3% of our calls and emails. Second year, once you get through that initial buildup of, okay, now I know what to do. Second year, this is a whole different picture. So in summary, um, gross revenue, 1.582 million. Net to the town was a little over 1.1 million. Uh, parked vehicles, we went through 100, about 150,000. Citations. Uh, those that did not pay, 2.4%. Um, no zones, 1.6%. Overall total, 4%. And the citations paid, 79%. Uh, and the balance is either gone or will shortly be gone. I think we're still working on uh, August and September getting those to collections. The... The last page that I've got is the one specific change that I need to make for 2024. Does address that parking opposing traffic. Um, we do need to work on that. Uh, we've already started to implement the capability in our system. We will need some signage for customer education. Um, we have worked really hard with town staff to balance signage so that it's not too much, but enough to educate location. We worked with a uh, public works team, the streets department to move signs where it's most appropriate. Um, these signs would probably be temporary signs to go on the existing post. They would not be new posts, not all. And they would only be specifically uh, targeted at the streets that are affected by this requirement. Okay, any questions? Uh, I'll say wow, thank you. Uh, <laughs> great job, sir. Uh, and great customer service, thank you. Thank you. 1,400 spots, you said we had 627 visitors daily. Average per day. Average yes. per day, and 174 residents average per day. Correct. Some come and go. Uh, so 1,400 spots seem to be sufficient. The only second week of June and five days of the year that it's not, you are correct. There are those five Saturdays and a couple of other holidays, 4th of July, Labor Day, Monday, uh, Memorial Day, if the weather's good. If not, it'll be some other Saturday. 
but the rest of the time, the you know, except for about five days, the parking spaces were not full. And that's with resident permits of 18,583. So, Correct. and Correct. still there was enough resident parking. Correct. Wow. Because residents can park in any space. Right. They're not limited to the resident only spaces. They can park anywhere. You, you mentioned decals a couple of times. Are you a proponent of us going back to some kind of decal? No. Okay. <laughs> Please. Please no. Okay. I had to ask. <laughs> uh, and then fines of $156,375. And most of that has been $156,375 for fines. Fines paid, yes. And paid. And then there's 25 or 30% outstanding. Yes, 21% outstanding. This, and, and we'll see, we typically see about 75% of those get paid uh, over time uh, through the collections process. We'll see that through the winter months. Uh, That's when we have the time to actually devote to that. If I wore a hat, I'd take my hat off to you, sir. Very good job. No other questions. Thank you. I have one question. Uh, if I take off down here and get all these tickets, citations, and I go back to Ohio, I come back next year, what happens? Ticket's still there. So I, did you? I'll give you, and if you don't pay next year, I'll give you another ticket. Okay. And it'll still go to collections. Okay. I just I can't tow and, it or anything. And, <laughs> and you know, the, the, the interesting part of collections, um, as part of the insurance law in the United States, collection agencies can only do so much, at which point they have to stop. At the point where they stop, the only thing that they can do for leverage is to report that as an unpaid debt to the credit bureau. And that's usually the final straw that gets people to close them out. I just got one more thing. Um, you were paid the ultimate compliment at our annual Halloween party at a local establishment here. Uh, two people showed up, one as a enforcement officer and the other one as a yellow bumper. Yes. <laughs> That's great. So, um, <laughs> yeah, yes, we did. We all, we also had a few T-shirts made Is that, right? that say "No bumper, no parking" with a graphic. Um, <laughs> So that's that's a that's a team favorite as well. Great. I'm sorry, Mr. Brock. So, I, again, um, exceeding expectations is always a wonderful place to be. That being said, I'm very confident that when council has a chance to think about recommendations, there'll be a number of them. You know, because we're talking to residents, and residents have seen other issues, and or one other improvement. So, um, I don't want to start the celebration tonight. I think we still have work to do and we still have a public meeting and there's still some things that we need to work out. Um, and all joking aside about the bumper, um, I think messaging is still going to be important in year two. Um, well, definitely. Particularly around the reapplication process, right? Because everyone is going to have to reapply. So although you're forecasting the number of emails and calls will go down, I think we should be strategizing how we can help residents reapply in a smooth and efficient way. I mean, what can we do to help that process? Correct? Right. And you're thinking about that, right? We do that every year. And well, that's all. You and may do it every year, but we haven't done it yet. So um, You haven't done it yet, but the real process for us is providing enough staff, phones, emails, et cetera, in the spring. So when council makes its decisions or makes suggestions for improvements and whatever we do to adjust this for the coming year, um, we do want to make sure that we are ready um, because uh, we've already had 200 plus uh, calls asking for their permits for next year, residents. Right, we haven't, um, even, we haven't set rates yet, but um, so that, you know, and, and that comes down to the sooner the better, uh, because as soon as I can post it, as soon as you can post it on That was website, my next question. What's the window? Well, January, theoretically? The window is up to you. Okay. I would prefer to see it done 
Yes, I do. Now, December, I'd like to have it you know, online <clears throat> in January, but I know that that's practically not always feasible. Um, last year, we started in March and April, um, and we got through the year. Now, we had a big We're bubble of activity there, but and, and we'll expect to see something similar to that this year. We're famous for moving with alacrity here. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've already sort of talked to you all about having a special meeting for this. Uh, and November 23rd, I think, is what everybody came back with a consensus on. 28th. 28th? I'm sorry. Uh, November 28th. Um, so we can get that out there here soon for the public forum for a discussion with the public on their parking ideas. Uh, and we can get that meeting so we can hear what is out there and the changes that uh, citizens and everybody's going to bring forward. Uh, and then look at the December time frame to get something back for meet the January deadline. Well, what we needed, and I think you did a great job, what we needed was we needed to deal with facts, which we weren't for many years. It was just, uh, well, maybe if we do this, maybe, but we got the facts now, gives us a basis to work from, and it should improve as time goes on, correct? Okay. Exactly. You know, we, we spent a lot of time making sure that we had facts for you as needed. Jim, thank you for all of the data. That's um, a yeoman's effort there um, to pull all of that together. I'm I'm curious where you have percent um, of parked cars uh, per day, you know, based mm -hmm. per month. Will your data tell you where the um, most crowded accesses were? Do you have that granular uh, information I where have, which I, accesses need the most work in terms of capacity? The data is there by parking zone. Okay. Um, I don't have to go look at it. I can tell you that the area around the pier, 604 lot, um, is absolutely the number one hotspot. That is the busiest area. Uh, from that, you get down to the point, um, and, and those, are, those are the two, two areas, without a doubt. We see a lot of people who come on the island from the east end, and they pull down the first street, and they just, all those lots uh, from McGlamory right on down through the pier and Barbie fill right up. Barbie fills up. Um, and then we get some, and when that gets full, that's when we start seeing some problems. And it, the problems are, hey, I'll make a spot. And <laughs> they get a ticket. Uh, and then they get mad, but there wasn't any place to park. Yes, there were lots of places to park, but not where you may have wanted to be. And that is always the challenge. Or there wasn't a spot in my favorite beach access. Yes, if you came at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I can guarantee you it was probably full. Um, so that takes time for people to recognize that this is a high-demand area. Um, the growth in Brunswick County isn't going to help it. Um, is 1,400 spots enough? Um, this year I would have said yes. I don't know what it's going to be in the future. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. One last thing, if I may. Yes. And I'll save it till the 28th, but uh, I'll ask you on the 28th if you do have thoughts on additional spots, on where we could secure additional spots. I worked with town staff this last spring and identified the easy ones and the not so easy ones. And I know they've implemented the easy ones. I would probably just go right back to that same assessment and see where the other opportunities are. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you all too. very much. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Moving right along. Um, adjustment and approval of the agenda. Any changes? 
Everyone good? Public comment. Um, I will need a motion to approve the agenda. Oh, I'm sorry. Missed that. So moved. To approve the Second. agenda as presented. Second. Thank you very much. And thank you, Lisa, for the reminder. Um, public comment. Lisa, if we can allow Pledge to Paint to go first. Okay. Um, Cheryl Sherman. Hey, everybody. My name is Cheryl Sherman. I'm a local resident. I'm here on behalf of Pledges of Bank. I have a letter here from um, Laura Morgan, who is our um, founder. But before I start, I do want to say that in our 13 year history, we've never had a mayor come and um, speak at our walks. So this was the first year that Mayor White showed up to kick us off on our first day of our walk. And I just want to recognize her for that. We really appreciate it. So here's the letter. It says, Dear Fabulous Residents of Oak Island, y'all nailed it. Never in our 13-year history have we, had, have we felt so welcome, so appreciated, and so loved. Here we are almost a month out from our event, and our Flockstar community is still on a high and gushing over the social media about the magical time they had at our beautiful island. As the founder of Pledge the Peak, Pink, I can tell you that our 2023 event was the best one we've ever had, thanks to your incredible community. Everywhere we went, we were greeted with smiles and questions of how can we help. Everyone from Jeff at the First Baptist Church to Amy at the Publix Deli Counter and Mike at the Elks Lodge bent over backwards to ensure that our group was taken care of and feeling the love. By the numbers, we had 1,400 registrants traveling from 49 states and eight countries with approximately 450 friends and family. I felt confident that they all ate and drank and shopped their way all over the island. More than 3,000 or more than 300 locals answered the call for volunteers and joined the West Brunswick High School cheerleaders and countless others along the course, along the courses and at Middleton Park to make sure our registrants were having the time of their lives. Oak Island photographers lined up to provide free photography services. Locals showed up with trucks filled with items to donate to our auction, and the Girl Scouts came out to welcome all 252 of our survivors. Almost 40 local businesses either sponsored us or made donations. We raised just shy of $700,000 this year. That's almost 7,000 mammograms, which will likely save hundreds of lives. Y'all made the weekend so successful that we have already 1,000 Flock Stars registered for our 2024 event in Amelia Island, and that's a new sign-up record. From the bottom of our collective hearts, thank you for hosting Pledge the Pink and showering us with so much love and hospitality. We look forward to possibly returning in the near future. It would be an honor and a privilege to showcase your wonderful community again. She did want me to mention that um, she said, I'd be remiss if I didn't have a special shout out to Oak Island's dynamic duo of roses, Miss Rose Brom from the town and dear Rose McDonald at the Senior Center. The event would never have happened without them and their steadfast support. So they definitely would like to come back. So we'll talk about that later, I guess. But thank you again for letting us have our event here. So Cheryl, just for perspective for the crowd, so the money uh, raised this year is close to three times what they have uh, in previous years. I think it was um, 243. No, last year we raised 725000 okay. but we had 1,500 walkers, so we had more. And being this is the first time we've been out of South Carolina, they knew it would be a drop okay. in registrations, but they're very thrilled with what we raised. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for you. that perspective. All right. Thanks. Just to read a couple of comments that Cheryl gave me, um, things pulled from social media. People were so nice and welcoming. I can see why people like to live here. Uh, such a welcoming community. Um, <laughs> we spoke with lots of locals and made sure to hit the shops and some twice. Ice cream, anyone. Uh, Oak Island will go down as the most supportive and embracing location to ever host Pledge the Pink. This is amazing, the money is great, but the love is awesome, and the comments just go along in that vein. Mm -hmm. So good job, Oak Island. You've really shown uh, yet another organization how special a place 
it is we live and how terrific our residents are. So uh, good job. Okay, we have Phil Dudley. I'm Phil Dudley, 218 Seller Street. Uh, I'm with uh, Tree Peace OKI. You can find us on Facebook and treepeaceoki.org. Um, to have an intelligent conversation, you have to start with the same set of facts. We have set facts now in the tree canopy study. It's marvelous. Well, it's actually marvelously bad if you live here on the island. In eight years, we've lost 10% of our tree canopy. We've lost 197 acres. I was corrected on that, Bill. I'm sorry. Dara, Royal, none other than Dara. So don't question me. I got back up. It was 197 acres we lost on the island. Uh, yeah, we need a third data point, but we can extrapolate and on a straight line over the last eight years. We go forward eight years. In 2030, we will have lost a full 20% from 2014. Almost 400 acres. So we got to do something. Um, the report, uh, the excellent report, suggests... Uh, not the report we saw up here, but the report that you have in your hands, that we invest in urban forest monitoring, maintenance, and management in the town budget. That we plan on the right-of-ways. We develop a proactive street maintenance, a street maintenance program. It's, it's key that so you don't become a heat sink that you do have shade over your asphalt. That's from the report. We develop outreach programs for private land owners to include tree giveaways. We know the challenges of working with UDO was well expressed tonight. Um, thank you, Mr. Barr. Um, one thing was missing and he left. Um, when he, he, they put a value on it, they did not put a value on the windbreak. I would love to see that given back to them, perhaps by email. Those trees save our roofs when we have tropical storms, especially the live oak, with its twisted grain and those little leaves that turn against the wind, they're amazing. The, 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 the root structure is broad and deep. They have little risk of toppling over, but they do a wonderful job as a windbreak. Uh, if somebody could reach back to them and ask them that, I'd love to see if he put a value on it. He was from the Midwest. They have tornadoes. Those things aren't going to stand up to tornadoes. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, that's it. This is, we can work from the same set of facts now, and this is great news and um, to have that data. But in closing, um, council, uh, Councilors uh, um, Bell and, and Blaylock, you are not going to have the pleasure of hearing my addresses in the future because I'm probably not going to address them in December. So, so I know you're going to miss that. Um, I want to wish you both good health, and I hope to see you around the island. Thank you all for your service. Thank you, Phil. I don't have anyone else signed up. Wow. Surprising. So we'll move on. Uh, council reports. Mr. Bob. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, in the spirit of, of being an exceptional community, I, I want to thank all of the, the residents who were actively involved in the last campaign. It was vigorous. It was um, well enunciated, and that makes us stronger. Um, I also want to congratulate all the candidates. I think that to have the courage to step into the arena, as Teddy Roosevelt would say, is everything. And we had a number of really excellent candidates. Obviously, I want to congratulate Mr. Chulo and um, Ms. Gartner, and it's good to have Mr. Kraft back again, as much as sometimes we disagree. It's still a pleasure. Um, I, I think the task now is we need to find a shared path forward that encompasses divergent views. We are just simply not going to agree on all things. But we can work together towards compromise and move forward. And as everyone in this room, I believe, knows, there are a myriad number of issues that we need to take on. That being said, there are two issues that I've been tasked by council to work on and I want to give a brief interim report. So as you may know, we have passed a code of ethics, um, but it did not have an attendant process. So I have drafted and submitted to council for their approval and the mayor um, a process which lays out how a complaint is actually filed and a form to complete 
and we are looking at having an independent neutral party other than council screen these if uh, they are submitted. So that we're still working on that, but there's been substantial progress, um, and I await uh, the feedback from my colleagues. And we are also working on revising the managerial evaluation process, and I have drafted that process, and it will be coming out for council next in January. We are revising the process to make it more contemporary, to involve uh, a greater deal, uh, more information and better analytics, and hopefully, ultimately, better feedback to the manager, uh, informing uh, his or her uh, sense of direction. So we're moving forward on those two fronts, and uh, my colleagues will see that shortly. And uh, end the report, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Some of your colleagues will see it. <laughs> yes. I'll send you a special <laughs> Correct. As I sat up here and listened to the Pledge to the Peak, I was beaming. I do want to thank our residents for, for participating and making them feel as welcome as they did. I'd also like to thank Rose and staff and the mayor for making them feel so welcome. I'm not saying a whole lot, Bill. Oh, okay. I'm headed out, remember? <laughs> uh, oh, congratulations to everyone. Yes. Uh, I believe uh, the town manager is attending. I think uh, the mayor is attending, but uh, Thursday and Friday, I'm going to Wilmington to the Beach Inlet and Waterway Annual Conference to uh, learn what, what I can about beach renourishment, uh, water rights, what have you. Uh, people have called me in the last month or so asking how come Southport or how come some other town received a lot of grants, where, were, where was ours? Uh, two years ago, we got $20 million grant. Uh, the information we heard tonight on the tree uh, overlay, that was from a grant. Uh, crosswalk uh, money is from, from the state. So uh, believe me, we're way ahead of the game. Uh, I just wanted to get that out there. Thanksgiving, bless her heart, uh, Clarissa Cope and uh, the Oak Island Angels are going to be using the building uh, next door to prepare Thanksgiving meals. Uh, for so many deserving families. Uh, learn what the OK, OKI Angels do. They, they rally around families that are in need. And, uh, they'll be using that facility on Thanksgiving Day. I attended the Environmental Advisory Board's meeting, uh, uh, listened to their needs on, on their budget needs for, for next year, and learned that they are going to come up with a uh, Friends of Stormwater uh, Award. Uh, so they're being, they're being proactive. Uh, there's a whole lot of stuff going on in Oak Island, and as far as advisory boards, uh, give thought to that. Uh, we got some good people in this town, and it sure would be good to get some of those good people in this town on some of these boards. So that's me. I'll hush. Thank you. I was just shocked by Bill hushing so soon. <laughs> <laughs> there's a ball game. <laughs> oh, I should have known. Uh, I just want to say what a great feeling I got from the reports tonight. I think it's a, it's a great thing. And uh, to all those people out there who have been calling me and telling me what a good job I did over the years, if I'd have known that, I might have ran again. But nobody <laughs> told me. Not unless you wanted to move. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, I have no updates this evening. We're still waiting on uh, scores from all of our transportation and pedestrian safety projects that were uh, put on the priority list. So I was hoping to have scores tonight, but they're not back yet from the DOT. I guess they don't move as fast as I want them to, but. Really? I find that hard to believe. So um, building on Mr. Box uh, comments, it was a terrific voter turnout. I really appreciate the enthusiasm for this, um, this particular campaign. Again, thank you. To all of the candidates um, who put themselves out there to run, and congratulations to Bill, Terry Cartner, and Bob Chulo um, for uh, <laughs> thank you for all you will do. <laughs> Looking forward, so um, uh, much appreciated, and. Um, 
I had mentioned uh, a couple of meetings ago about how the uh, the local mayors have kind of a coalition, and um, we have made initial efforts on um, on the um, workforce housing project. We have uh, started collecting data and looking for data sources, identified potential. Um, employers who would be interested in participating. This will take uh, efforts on the part of the state, the county, the local municipalities, and of course the business community to bring this to a reality. This is not uh, uh, a short course. This is going to take um, best maybe three years if we're able to leverage developments that are currently underway. Um, uh, but more likely five to seven years, uh, but to at least have it on the radar and to have visibility and to move from concept to action is a major step. So I really appreciate all that uh, uh, the mayors have invested. David and I continue to meet periodically with NCDOT about the projects currently in the approval process or that have been approved. Um, he's reported on those regularly and um, uh, I, hopefully you've noticed that the lines on West Oak Island Drive and uh, the Beach Drive have been painted, repainted. Uh, so thank you, David, for getting that done. Um, and of course, the sidewalks phase one will begin early spring. So we're excited about that. Um, today, uh, Mr. Kelly and I attended an initial multi-agency uh, meeting to coordinate the data collection and sampling the core samples that are needed um, to um, get or inform the permits for our beach nourishment in 24-25, currently scheduled December 24 through April 25. So uh, it, <laughs> it was very clear in our discussions that there's a great deal of work that needs to get done. It's a complicated process. Uh, we have agreement across organizations to work together to get that done. And um, so we're fingers crossed, we'll be able to, um, to meet that goal. And then um, as Mr. Kraft mentioned, um, I'll be attending the NC Byways meeting uh, Thursday and Friday. Um, the Veterans Day ceremony at the Elks <coughs> was standing room only. It was a great uh, uh, event and uh, followed by lunch. So any of you that attended um, uh, could uh, <coughs> certainly uh, attest to that. Just a reminder that the tree lighting ceremony is Friday, December 1st at 530. Um, and uh, Christmas by the Sea Parade is Saturday, uh, December 2nd, uh, starting at 2 p.m., followed by the holiday craft market. So I think, Rose, we're still taking applications. Um, so if you're interested in participating in the parade and or the craft uh, market, please get your applications in. And um, last but not least, this was kind of a... Uh, top of mind as I made this list uh, this afternoon, but I've been uh, very pleased to um, be asked to work with the Parks and Rec Committee and uh, have been very impressed as they have worked through um, a uh, strategic planning effort. It was a bit of a novel approach that had some really positive outcomes and um, I look forward Mr. Dubai, I guess we'll have a report sometime soon on that effort. So um, uh, it's nice to see them humming and moving forward. And then I just want to wish everyone a safe Thanksgiving holiday. If you're traveling, um, please uh, be safe on the road and um, hope everyone enjoys a warm Thanksgiving holiday. So that's four reports. Move to approval of minutes, the consent agenda. Do I have a motion to Senate approve the minutes? Second. Yes. All in favor? Unanimous. 
committee appointments. We have three different advisory committees with open seats. I think council uh, already has the ballots. If you'll sign them and David will collect them. Uh, just one comment. There's a misspelled word on the very first advisory item. Fire Picky, picky, picky. Thank you for pointing that out. You're welcome. Anytime, Lisa. I don't even see it. Uh, <laughs> I see it now. I don't know why I'm handing it to you. <laughs> it's like one of those things you see on the internet. If you can read this, you must be a genius, kind of. Possibly. Well, let's not go that far. It's one word. So we'll wait for the vote count. <laughs> that wasn't difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Is that I think we got this one. Yes. Yeah. Do you want to read the results, please? Um, I'd be glad to if I can just summarize because it's the yes. same. So there were three applicants for three different positions on three different committees, and everyone received one vote from every council member. So unanimously appointed to all four. And the, uh, the one for the Environmental Advisory Committee will go for the longest. Yes, ma'am. I will put that in the longest term and re advertise the other positions. Excellent. Thank you very much, and thank you, council. Administrative reports, Mr. Kelly. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'll go ahead and Ms. Willis come up. Um, as you know, the town's getting ready to start a survey, or we have started a survey. Uh, she's going to go over the process that we're doing, what we're trying to gain out of it, what we're going to utilize it for, and we'll turn it over to Ms. Willis. Great. Thank you, Mayor, Council. Um, so the purpose of the community survey is to help the town gather input from the community on lots of issues, including quality of life, satisfaction of core town services, and some perceptions of safety and value. Um, the results will provide some statistically valid insights that leaders can use as a tool to plan for the future. Um, and this will provide data to compare over time or with other cities and town benchmarks. So, these are designed to be done every year or every other year, um, and they're pretty basic um, community surveys. They all kind of use the same questions um, asked in the same, same way. So the goals for this are to achieve some statistically significant results. Our um, goal is going to, of thir 385 resident respondents, and that will give us a um, plus or minus 5% margin of error with 95% confidence. Um, and speaking with our communications um, manager, Mike, he said normally our surveys get around 300 people. So um, we really encourage everyone to um, take this survey and participate so we can make sure that we get some, some good results in that. Um, so our goal will be 385, but I'm really hoping we can we can push that. And then hopefully, um, not hopefully, in January, I'll deliver the report um, for the meeting, and hopefully in time for budget season, you'll have that data available for you. Um, so our marketing efforts for this, um, we're going to use the town website. Um, Mike has worked on a news release. We're gonna use the town social media, the current, the e-newsletter, it's gonna be in that. Um, okay, information, so the, the email alerts. Um, we've mailed postcards with a link to the survey, um, and we're also doing um, a gift card drawing. So the survey will be anonymous, but to encourage people to take the survey um, at the end, they can opt in to um, be in the drawing to win a gift card. And then this is just a picture of the postcard, and so hopefully it'll be easy. You can scan it and take you right to the survey and take it. So just to walk through some of the um, questions on the survey and um, kind of the question types, um, the most common one is this first one. Um, so it's a Likert scale, but 
um, a question in each one. So they choose one option for each row as they go down. Um, and they're each divided into sections, so the quality of life section. And then um, I kind of grouped our town services. So um, there's um, a section that's police and fire and safety. Um, and then kind of each section groups different parts of the services that the town offers. Another type of question that you'll see on there are, um, so that one is, what are three preferred sources of receiving information about the town of Oak Island? And it's a um, select up to three. So you, you choose the top three in one question. And then um, another question is, a, another Likert scale, but this is where you just select one. So how likely are you to recommend living in Oak Island to someone who asks? And then um, the last type is an open-ended question, but this is the only one within the survey. Um, so in a few words, what should be the top priority for the town to address in the next year? So not too many of those. Most of them, to be able to show you, the data are um, multiple choice. Um, so here's the key information again for everyone. It's open from November 13th, November 14th, excuse me, to November 30th. Um, it's open to anyone, residents, property owners, visitors, business owner over the age of 18. And one of the questions is you indicate which one of those you are. So we'll be able to report that, um, you know, residents feel this way about one thing, but maybe visitors feel this about another. So that'll be nice to... Um, parse out. It is anonymous survey um, and only one submission is allowed per person. Um, you can also save it and continue later so if you don't want to do it in one sitting you don't have to. It'll it'll save that for you. Um, but it should only take about 10 minutes, 15 minutes if you're really taking your time. And again, respondents can choose to enter the drawing at the end. If they want to provide an email, they can, but it's not gonna, um, we're not gonna connect it to your results and say, ooh, that person said this. It's, it's still anonymous, but um, just trying to encourage more people to fill out the survey. And that is a link to it as well, just to have up here for the audience tonight. But yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions about, about it. Questions for Holly Willis? No, uh, I, I understand your, your need for data. I, I've already spoken to the manager about the timing and the fact that council did not see the survey before it was released, which I think as a matter of protocol, we should change that sort of dissemination process. Uh, I think you agree with that, right, Mr. Yeah. Kelly? As noted. As noted, thank you, fair enough. I would agree. Um, I think anything that goes out to the public of this nature, it'd be nice at least for council to know about it in advance and have an opportunity to see the content or even perhaps uh, suggest um, content um, as, as we go forward. So I would agree with that. Um, and the, how are we accessing the visitors? Hallie, on the, so visitors can answer the, the question, how are we reaching out to visitors? Um, in all the social media ways, uh, they won't receive a postcard, but anyone that comes across it, um, probably most likely Facebook is how people will find out about it, um, can be open to anyone. So I still think all that information is useful um, and, you know, we'll just be able to parse it out if it's something we don't think. And the more respondents, the higher the validity of the assessment. So we're not pocketing, you know, we're not. So we'll still only track residents for that 385 number because the margin of error is based on our po on our population of full time residents. Right. Um, and and the margin of error is. The 95% is just a common number people use. Um, how confident are we that the sample matches our actual population, which I don't think we'll have any problem with. So that's probably going to be accurate. And to the other point, um, the these surveys 
Um, I, t I take the point that I'm sorry that you didn't get, get to make edit to it, edits to it, but they really are kind of the same across the board. Um, it wasn't like me just deciding what, what ones I thought were best. Um, it's really a basic thing so we can compare. Over time, it shouldn't really change depending on topics. It's so that in you know, eight years we can say, oh, we really improved in this one thing. But if we were looking at um, you know, something smaller, we might not be able to compare over time like that. Right. And to benchmark cities. So um, I don't, we don't internally have that data. A lot of these are um, contracted with researchers that are doing all this and have um, full-time staff and research into marketing. But um, still, we want to ask those questions the same so that were we ever to do that, the results would be similar and would, would make sense. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate uh, we, that. You know, we brought her on board. One of the first things that we talked to her about was surveys that we had seen when we were going through looking at her job descriptions and those kind of things. And she had actually done one previously where she was employed. Um, so what we looked at it is we, um, when you look at the companies that provide these services, it's to be non-political. Mm -hmm. um, it's to be the same question asked again year over year over year. Understood. And is to lay out uh, services that are provided within the municipality, city, or whatever county. Um, so there was no intent not to associate council with the survey, um, but it was something that the tool that we were using in-house to be able to provide something for you when you get to your retreat or budget that would be able to be utilized uh, that we could have some numbers for you for that. So Understand. No, and I don't mean um, this we intended or wanted to edit any of your questions on this survey. It's simply a communication channel breakdown. Um, just not knowing, right hand not knowing what the left hand's doing. It's nothing personal or no comment about this survey. Yeah, and as to the timing too, like I had actually worked on it in July, like again after I started, I started working on it. Um, and then we thought, oh, well when would make sense to do this if we were gonna do it annually or biannually in July, we thought, oh, well, let's line it up with budgeting time. So, again, that decision made sense in July. <laughs> <laughs> right. We just want to be careful I about I think the, the, the point is what you did is fine, and I understand the, the rationale. My concern was procedural, and I've already spoken to the manager, and it has nothing to do with, with your survey, just to be clear. Okay. okay. Great, and I encourage everyone to take it, so please do. <laughs> you can win a $25 gift card to Publix. I knew about the survey. Good job. Thank you, guys. I knew about the survey. Poor thing. That, that $25 gift card is not going to do much, yeah. Charlie. Yeah. You know about that? I am, too. Yes. Yes. Go to Publix, it'll be good. <laughs> yeah. Ask Charlie if he needs to call home. Right? Mr. Kelly? Anything else? Mr. Eats? Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, where are we? All right. Reports. Old business. The honors program. Huh? The honors program. Old business. Uh, consideration of Oak Island honors flag program and policy. Mr. Dubai. Dubai or Dubai? I'm sorry. Dubai. Dubai. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Town Council. At this time, the Oak Island Recreation Advisory Board would like to submit the following recommendation to you. As a way to show appreciation and honor our current, past, and fallen members of the armed forces, we would like to recommend an Oak Island Honor Flags program. This program will be a personalization of the Hometown Heroes Banner Program. Uh, this initiative was started in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania in 2006. These banners are mounted around town on utility poles. Uh, this is problematic here on Oak Island because of the high winds and the high winds we see and hurricane threats. Someone would have to be on call to take down and put back up at a moment's notice. 
This could amount to uh, several times throughout the year. We have opted to utilize rectangular mobile banner flags instead. The use and custom Oak Island Honors branding has already been approved by Hometown Heroes Banner Program as an acceptable form of display. These would be double-sided and would be, given, uh, would be driven in the ground using a 20-inch stainless steel ground stake with a weather-resistant weather coating. These could be relocated with ease, uh, taking minutes to install instead of the effort needed to install on utility poles, uh, similar to the town's Christmas lights. Here's a concept layout of the banner flag. We would install these around the sidewalk at Middleton Park or Veterans Park. We propose to only put these up during the long holiday weekends of Memorial Day, 4th of July, Labor Day, 9-11, and Veterans Day. There's a draft policy that has been written in an application process in front of you, and either the, whole, the honoree or the family of the honoree must have standing in Oak Island. 24 applicants will be, chosen, will be chosen in a lottery, as well as the location of their flag in each park. Here's the proposed location at Middleton Park and proposed location at Veterans Park. The VFW will help us vet each application and the town will provide background checks. The families of the Oak Island honoree would be paying for these banners and feel that they, among other volunteers, would help in installing and taking down. The program would run a full year cycle with each banner flag and given to the family at the end of the year. We could promote through the town website, local VFW, American Legion posts, lodges, the local newspaper and other social media outlets. The only cost the town would incur would be for staff within the recreation department to implement this and provide background checks of the honoree. The advisory board will volunteer to assist staff in getting this program off the ground. Initially, we would like to recommend this program to start with this next Memorial Day. We would install 24 of these and take down each day over these long weekends. In summary, this program will be open to all fallen, retired, and active members of all branches of the military must have standing in the town to qualify either honoree resides or family of the honoree resides in Oak Island. There will be an application process and a selection process based on the policy in your agenda packet using a lottery system. The cost of each banner is $70 and the applicant will bear the cost of the banner flag. The town will bear the cost of the background check. The maximum number of banner flags will be 24. Flags will be installed during the long weekends of Memorial Day, 4th of July, and Labor Day at Middleton Park, and 9-11 and Veterans Day at, Met at Veterans Park. We would solicit volunteers from the families honoring the hero to help put up and take down the banner flags each day. We recommend that the flags do not stay up overnight. After the full year cycle, the banner flags would be returned to the family of the honoree. Uh, the Recreation Advisory Board is looking for a path forward <clears throat> in implementing such a program here. Um, thank you for your time and uh, would be happy to field any questions at this time. Any questions by council? Uh, Paul, I know you've been working on this for a long time and I want to thank you for being proactive, sir. Thank you. Well uh, done. Well done. You solved the puzzle. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Quick question. In your lottery-based system, assuming you get more than 24 qualified applicants, if someone is chosen for, for one cycle, they're not eligible for a second cycle to give somebody else an opportunity since it's a lottery-based system? Um, that, can be, um, that can be considered. Uh, I think a, a lot of it's going to be based on how many applicants we really see you know, this year. Um, uh, we're hoping with... Uh, uh, you know, promoting over the next couple of months uh, that we're going to get a lot of applica applicants. And I think if we do, then that's something to consider that we would, uh, we would not um, allow them to participate the next year. Um, and with the cycle ending on Veterans Day, um, is there any plans to offer some sort of 
uh, procession or ceremony to turn the banner over to the family like you would traditionally see at a military uh, ceremony of, of such kind where the inductee is honored. There's usually a transition of how the banner is provided to the family. Is that in your plans as well? Yeah, we can definitely consider that too. We, we were thinking, we were batting around this last night, that there'd be a ceremony um, on Memorial Day, uh, uh, you know, once the banners are installed, uh, uh, invite the um, South Brunswick High School, maybe uh, ROTC to bring their honor guard over here um, and have a little ceremony to, to kick the whole program off. I think it's a great idea. I would just encourage you to maybe consider some of those items, yeah. how, the, how the lottery system may work in year two if you get more than 24 applicants. And then I really, I really do think some sort of ceremony on Veterans Day where the family receives the, the banner that they paid for would be uh, an appropriate. Very well, we will. Thank you. Uh, this goes toward what I've, I often say, softer, gentler, warm town. Way to go. Uh, we live in paradise. I can make a motion. I just had a clarifying question, if I may, Madam Mayor. The, uh, the, the flag, I don't know if you have an agenda packet, yeah, oh, well, I know what the flag looks okay. like. <laughs> well, I'm looking at the flag and the, the uh, application, and it appears that the application information being sought pretty much tracks the contents that will be on the flag. Yes. Um, so there won't be an opportunity for any additional statements other than what's reflected? No, just what's ref uh, the, uh, the items that are actually on the concept flag will be the only items with each, um, each applicant that will, will be allowed. And I think that's an important uh, point. As I read it down the left-hand side, we proudly honor, and then it has the name of the service member, the branch of service, the years of service, and then the name of the family beneath the picture. Yes. I'm sorry. Please tell me you don't want me to repeat all that. <laughs> all right, I, so, th so that's that, and, and then. Put it up on the screen also. Thank you, I'm, I'm looking at it on my screen now. Thank you, sir. So that information, pretty much mirrors the type of information being sought in the application form. Correct. All right. And Madam Mayor and, and Council, the reason why I bring that up, if you'll look on page 47 of the agenda packet, the second to the last bullet point reads, town staff shall retain final approval authority of flag wording. Wording of provocative nature, such as profanity, advertisements, political statements will not be permitted. That seems to suggest that some type of wording is allowed other than the items that are on this flag. So uh, to, to, to avoid that confusion, I would recommend if the council's inclined to adopt this policy that we remove that bullet point. And then, I, and I may miss it, but I don't see in here, I know on the bullet point, sir, in your presentation you had about returning the flag after a year to the family. Yes. And Councilmember Morton asked a question about that. I don't see where that type of procedure is addressed um, in the policy. I don't know that it necessarily has to be, but if we want that to be a part of the policy that after the year it gets returned um, to the honoree or, or, or the applicant, we may want to include that in there. And, and those are my observations and questions. And thank you, sir. And thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, when do you anticipate opening the application process? Uh, immediately. As soon as it's approved, um, the plan is to uh, get, with, get with Mike on uh, how we're going to utilize social media uh, uh, to get the word out. Um, I already have plans to contact uh, American Legion and VFW. Uh, they know this is... Uh, coming down the pike and, and ready to help and uh, uh, help us out with this program. Um, timing on this is that we're looking at probably keeping the applications open until the end of January, and then that will give us uh, the months of February, March, and April to vet the candidates. Um, uh, and then we'll need some time to actually do the um, uh, you know, the layout and, pre and, pre and prepare um, the file in order to present to uh, Anley Flag Company, the, uh, the, the company we plan on uh, working with on this. They need 
they need approximately 30 days to produce the, uh, the flags that we'd be ordering. Thank you. Great job. Um, Mr. Kraft, you were going to... Um, I can make a motion to approve the... I just had a Go ahead. I'm sorry. Of clarification, uh, Mr. Eads. So um, I, I would agree that the majority of the data that's going to be presented on the banner would also come from the, the honorable discharge papers, the form DD-214. My concern, and I think maybe the reason why staff had that bullet point in there, is the family to be named under the photo is a free form that's not going to be derived from any military paperwork. They will be permitted to put anything in that field that they want. So if we exclude the ability to edit that field, since it's a freeform comment, but are we now obligated to go ahead and print a banner with regardless of what the family puts there as their reference to be named? Because essentially a family could say committee to elect X, Y, Z as their family name, and that information is not validated by the discharge papers provided by the military. So I'm, I'm concerned about removing that bullet point. It may be overly cautious, but I'd rather have something to fall back on versus nothing because, yeah. you know, it's, it is kind of a free form text in that field. Councilor Rees, would, would you be comfortable with leaving the first sentence in, in that bullet point and excluding the rest? Well, I think, I think the, the, the better approach, and again, this is not your tech, your, your run of the mill first amendment issue because this is not, this is a program that we're allowing these flags to be flown that we don't otherwise have to do. I just didn't want to give the impression that people could play games with the family name. So to answer your question, Mr. Kraft, I, I think if we index that last bullet point to the family name, and I would assume if you had some bogus family name on its face like that, that would be considered a, 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 a not a complete application, but your point's well taken, and, and if that's the goal of it, and then if all we're trying to do here is make sure the family name's not some end around to some nefarious activity, I'm fine with keeping it in there. I just always, when you have to read the contents of a sign, antennas go up immediately. So that was my point, but I, I see your point, Mr. Martin. And then in terms of, um, it would completely be up to the presenter this evening whether they want to f formally commit to uh, a Veterans Day ceremony with the, with the banner. I'm okay if it's not included in this motion this evening, because I understand I kind of brought that up on short notice, and I'd hate to to make this organization try to commit to to putting something together by next Veterans Day. Um, I, I trust, and it sounds like in good faith, that they would be willing to work on looking at some sort of transitional ceremony yeah, with and the banner, uh, but I, I'm not, I don't want to put words in their mouth and, and make them commit to trying to pull that off next year. I, I, I was more focusing on if the flag's going to be returned. I don't see that on the application, and that works both ways if we don't say that it's going to be returned. I think it says there uh, under the, the next bullet up that you were referring to, once the agreed upon term that the town will possess the flag until the end, the town will retain possession. So it, uh, that implies to me that there is a, a transition back sentence. to the owner. Right. It says the town will retain possession. Only during the cycle in, until it comes to an end. Yeah, and I don't want to overcomplicate those. I mean, I'm, this is the, the nature of this program is not going to lend itself to, yeah. to that type of thing. Because it, it does indicate the ownership is to the donor. So the donor is the owner. No, no pun intended for that rhyme. <laughs> um, but I, I do think it's important that the applicants realize that the, the exemplar flag you have here is what we're looking for. Uh, that's why we've that's why we've included in the uh, um, 
you know, the policy and application. That's why people don't like lawyers. Okay, so are, are, are we all yes, are sir. We good? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, I, th <laughs> <laughs> I think that we need to, to move this forward and not make this unduly complex. So I would suggest we amend the motion to say that um, we're approving it subject to continued um, review of the lottery system, whether it's annual or it's one time and also review of potential to create a ceremony. And just, those are things you can think about, I think you need to launch. And so, those are the concerns council has expressed. Uh, they've been satisfied, the concerns. We're good with that. Pardon? We're good with that. Okay, fine. That's, so that's your motion? That's my motion. I can second it, whatever it is he said. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best thing to do, yeah. <laughs> All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you for your effort. Thank you very much. much. Thank and you, congratulations to the committee. Great job, committee. Yeah, I just Next to is the uh, consideration of amendment to Moffitt and Nickel contract for additional data collection for uh, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management study. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, you sort of referred to that earlier when we met with them today. Um, basically, a few months back in September, um, council approved $112,000 uh, amendment to the contract, and that was for the Beach Inlet Master Plan. Uh, basically, what that did is it allowed us to go out, and Mike's going to pull a map up, uh, the dotted line in the middle of the black line, um, what that was is the original site that Bones was looking at trying to find sand. Uh, and in stage two, that is the master plan that we were trying to find a sand source for the 50-year uh, project. Um, so there's two different things that we're looking at today. Uh, during the work, uh, as we were doing the extra core sampling and fiber cores, uh, we actually found a sand source to the south of the Bohm's original investigation site. Uh, so that is a good thing that we were out there doing these because we actually ran across a bed of sand. Um, with that said, we were working with Bohm's to lease um, this site to be able to put it onto our sand for the 24-25 project. So there's two different projects that we're talking about. Uh, the $170,000, uh, they went out, Muffin Nickel did, got two quotes for this work uh, the price came in $175,000. And basically what you see uh, in the red grid and the blue, this is the area of concerns that we have to go back and do additional sampling in to quantify this sand for our lease. Uh, it is time sensitive. Uh, we need to have this done in uh, and reviewed and sent to Bohm's by the end of December. Um, so what this does, with we found this source they come back and start looking at the requirements for the lease. So some of the studies that we have to do is called hard bottom. And what that does is it'll give us a depth that we're able to take the sand to. Uh, we may have to leave a two foot barrier or four foot barrier, whatever it comes back to be identified. But we're trying to get a thousand foot runway to be able to go back in and get four million cubic yards of sand. Um, so that is what this is for. We also have to do archeological for shipwrecks, um, weapons disposal, all kinds of things we have to look at in this site for it to be approved for us to be able to go back to Bohm's and put it into our lease. Um, one of the questions that had come back when we did the contracts this year, uh, 3.A or 3A, uh, it came back to where the master plan was about $2.5 million. Uh, we had the engineers, uh, Catherine and I called them today to make sure that the dollars we were looking at was still underneath the 2.5 as they had discussed, and it's actually adding in this $170,000 to that gets us to about 2.48 million, so it's still underneath the 500, I mean the 2.5. Um, so that is one of the things, and that is for the 24-25 project, not the master plan. Right. Um, so that is what is in front of you tonight. Uh, once it's approved, um, They'll be going out taking these samples 
so we can get the data back to Booms. Questions for Mr. Kelly? No, I, I have a comment. It's, uh, it's the case that there are always unanticipated costs, and that's what this is. And I'm comforted to hear you say that we still have a strategic reserve left. Um, but I hope that that reserve is going to weather the next set of unanticipated costs because we've spent an awful lot of money on engineering and we still don't have sand. And that's, that's my concern. Not with Moffat Nichols. That's end of comment. Um, I concur with Council Member Bach. Um, I have I share the same concerns. Um, it, it's I, I, I want to use the word. It's unfortunate that we've arrived to this point where we're having to move quickly because we've discovered sand. Um, I, I just my level of frustration stems from the time spent and the energy spent and the money spent on frying pan shoals when there was speculation all along that that was not a good sand source. So uh, it is what it is. And, and we've, we've identified sand and we need to do these surveys in order to go collect it. So I guess we're full steam ahead. Well, we are, and we, we, you know, we had a long prior discussion uh, with Moffat Nichols, a very public discussion about the percentage of the cost that was engineering related, and you know, it was it was approaching twenty percent, and then suddenly there's another unanticipated engineering cost. So, uh, I'm I'm just registering the same concern. I agree with my colleague Councilman Martin that. Uh, Hopefully we've found sand and we're actually going to be able to farm it and deliver the project. Um, and we really don't have a choice the way this is framed, right? So right. it's time sensitive and we need to do it. That doesn't mean we have to be happy about it. It just means we need <laughs> to do it. I'm no, not sir, happy. That is true. And we also talked today about other sources that we're looking at, um, the inner bar or the Wilmington Harbor Channel. Uh, we're still going to have to look at uh, the alternatives that we're having with that. Um, they still, the Corps needs to do some surveys to see what kind of quantities are left uh, after last year's or two years ago work that they placed on Ballhead. Uh, so there's a lot of options that we have still to determine, uh, but we got to make sure that we have enough sand available for us to be able to do our project. Uh, and the quantity that we're looking at will allow us enough sand, even if the Wilmson Harbor project federal government doesn't fund it and it falls out, we'll still have enough sand source permitted for us to be able to do our project. Yes, sir. Do we have a motion? Can I just ask one thing real quick sure. here? Sure, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, how did we come up against, and it's probably obvious, but I don't, how did we come up against this timeline? How, so the timeline that we're under right now is to be able to get a permit uh, by um, end of July uh, so we can bid this project for 24-25 that we have the uh, $20 million for um, in a timely manner in August to be able to start the project in December. And it's going to be a perfect world for us to get there. Um, there's no guarantees right this moment that we're going to make that deadline. Um, we are doing what we can. Um, we are the lease agreement that we're doing with Bones is something uh, not new, but new to us. Uh, we are working with them. We've given them everything that Bones has asked us to provide in a timely manner. We've done that. Um, council has given direction to Moffat Nickel to work with the other agencies. The meeting we had today uh, basically laid out all federal and state officials. Uh, that needs to be working on these. Uh, we heard some good feedback. We heard some questions. And the reason why we had these kind of meetings is to try to get ahead of the next phase. So as a timetable, uh, we're working on a uh, timetable to be able to uh, provide to the public that shows what we need to do and, and what it takes to get there. Uh, and Moffitt and Nichols should have that finished. Hopefully we'll have that at the December meeting to be able to the, put that online so the public can see exactly what we are doing and follow along with us. 
Um, but it is a very aggressive schedule um, to get this done. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure the word change order didn't come up in there anywhere. No. <laughs> Thank you. But what we're what we're looking at is Bones is they go out and find sand for everyone along the shorelines. They have a history then. And what they do is they go find the sites and then they do these studies. Uh, we don't have the five years to wait for these people to do the study on that site. So with that said, we're still having to meet what they would require themselves to do, we're having to do to satisfy their demands so they can give us a lease for us to be able to utilize the sand. Okay, thank you, Dave. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. So did I understand correctly when um, Army Corps of Engineers were here, they acknowledged that a lot of the data that we've already collected, they don't have to recollect as it goes with doing the data collection for qualifying as a federal beach. So the, the federal project that we have, uh, you're right about that. Everything that we're gathering from Moffett Nickel, um, near shore and intershore, uh, that is being passed along to the Corps, and the Corps is let us utilizing all their sites as well. Um, this is offshore, and, and what people need to realize, I mean, this is 17 miles offshore. Um, so this is a hopper, dre hopper dredge project. Uh, and for us to get this to the hopper dredges that are available to us um, in a timely manner and lock them in, we're going to have to have probably three dredges running around the clock to make this work, to get the volume of sand that we need to apply. In the um, window we have to. Yes, ma'am. And then today you heard us go ahead and address the, the dune that we currently have with the erosion and escarpment. Uh, we want that included in this, so some of these costs will will rise because we're asking for additional volumes to restore the dunes to a, a manageable level. So it is a lot of things that are moving that we'll try to keep you abreast of. Thank is you. the North Carolina Wildlife and Fisheries involved in the? Are they at the table with oh, yeah. Bone? Okay. It, there was uh, sixteen. Agency is there today, and federal or nine federal agencies today. So we had everybody listening and watching us today. Any other questions? No, I mean we're at the point of no return. Either we're all in or we're not. So we don't have to like it. We just have to approve it. Yes, sir. Or so not do the project. It's means. Do we have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the amendment to the 3A contract with Moffat Nickel in an amount not to exceed 170000 and to authorize staff to execute the amended contract upon review by the town attorney. Second, reluctantly. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. And with that, we move to uh, new business. Consideration of budget ordinance amendments. Catherine, or is this you? Would you like, I can address them. And if they have any questions, we can have Catherine. Um, yes, ma'am. So what you see in, well, you me start with the first one. <laughs> okay. Um, on page 51 there, um, basically what you see uh, in the description, uh, number one, security camera system, Motorola radios for the police department. Um, these are projects that were in last year's and the year before budget. Uh, these dollars did not get rolled over, so these were approved within the ARC funds for expenditures. Uh, so now we're placing the money back into that to uh, be able to pay for these items that have now come in or, and are now are being utilized. The number two item, initial cost for the five-year computer replacement program. Um, last year during the budget cycle, uh, we started talking about the um, speeds of our servers, uh, the protection that we had, those kind of things, uh, the years of our equipment, how old things were, and we asked Hooks to do a study. We also brought in the National Guard to do a security study for us, um, and what they brought back to us that uh, Catherine and I have reviewed, uh, we're trying to bring up our uh, computer system to a five-year replacement plan, so basically uh, everything under 2018 will be replaced currently. Uh, and we're looking at taking that out of the ARC funds as well. Um, so what you have in front of you is those numbers uh, for your consideration tonight. Thank you. Questions? Make the motion, Madam Mayor, if there are no questions. Uh, one quick question. 
Are, are we going to be presented with a remaining balance of the um, ARP funds at our workshop coming up? Yes, next sir. Year? Uh, we actually have a meeting with the ARP fund people in the morning. Tomorrow, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we have an audit coming tomorrow. So, yes, sir, we'll be able to give you the numbers. Okay. Councilman Martin, does that answer your question? It does. No. I just want to make sure we see the balance before we go into the budget cycle yes. next year. Understood. Make the motion to approve the budget ordinance amendments as presented. Second. All in favor? Unanimous. Do we need a break or let's go? Okay. Consideration of requests for proposals, the comprehensive land use plan update, Matt. Oh, I got one more. Budget amendment. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hold on, Matt. Um, so I'll go right ahead with this one. Um, this is the same kind of thing where we had money in the last year's budget that we need to appropriate uh, that needs to be carried over 20th Street, uh, Canal Walkover, uh, and then Northeast, I mean, excuse me, yes, Northeast 54th Street. Uh, that's a bulkhead. I gave Lisa the wrong uh, word there. I gave her walkway. Uh, so I apologize for that, but it's bulkhead. Um, and then the other is for professional services, which is legal and other outside professional services that we have. And that's in front of you tonight. Questions? Motion. Make the motion to approve the budget ordinance amendments as presented. Second. Okay. Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Matt. Okay. Okay, uh, so the last thing we have under new business is a consideration of a request for proposals for the comprehensive land use plan update. Uh, as you know, you budgeted money uh, this fiscal year to update our comprehensive land use plan. Uh, we've drafted a request for proposals. Uh, should council approve it, we'll go ahead and get that circulating among uh, uh, consulting firms that do land use planning. Um, the timetable for this would be, uh, should it be approved tonight, we'll go ahead and publish it tomorrow. Uh, questions would be due back to town staff on December 8th, and then proposals would be due back December 15th. So it would be, uh, if we have some, uh, some proposals, those would be in front of council in January. Um, as a part of those proposals, uh, the applicants would need to produce their qualifications, public engagement plans, so they need to provide how they're intending to reach out to the public to update uh, our comprehensive land use plan and do a full review uh, of our comprehensive land use plan for any area that needs to be updated. Uh, they'd also have to take it through all the requisite uh, public hearings and approvals, et cetera. Uh, since we have CAMA jurisdiction here in the town, it needs to be compliant with CAMA regulations as well. We're required to have that CAMA land use plan uh, <coughs> in order to participate in the program. Um, and so uh, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions you might have. Um, <coughs> pretty straightforward. We actually already had two consulting firms reach out to us this morning. Uh, have a good, good crop of applicants for us to take a look at. Uh, and consider and choose from. Questions for Matt? Um, more of a comment, Madam Mayor. Um, I think we need to give um, serious and strategic thought to what we expect the, the vendor to do in terms of public engagement. Um, and I mentioned that because the last time we did this, we, we, we had a, a rather robust and truly representative committee, which I was privileged to serve on it. But the problem is it took a year to right. deliver the comprehensive land use plan. And then it went on to the planning board and became the UDO. And we are struggling to change the UDO. So as we think about engagement, I think we, we have two dimensions. One is we want to have a representative group of citizens. That's been the theme of the last couple of months is how do we engage them? But we also need to expedite this because the two, as you know, are interrelated and they, they are connected tissue. And they're both foundational documents for the town. So I hope that as these bids, first of all, I hope bids are received and then we review it with a, with a really clear eye on how we're gonna present this to the public and how the public gets involved. Because that's really gonna be, I think, important. Absolutely, and that, that's the, the purpose of ask, tasking the consultant with presenting their plans. They have to present several options to us. Similar to like, like what you did with, um, I believe, the parks and recreation facilities 
study that just came out, uh, recent, that was just published recently, um, they need to come to us and it needs to be something that's substantial, as you mentioned, and also expedited. Um, we're fortunate that this is not a whole new comp plan. This is an update to our existing comp plan. So uh, it's not necessarily, uh, it doesn't have to be a full rewrite of the document as a part of that review and update. Um, so hopefully that'll give us some, some speed uh, as opposed to you know, drafting an entirely new plan uh, that you might see in some places, so. Yes, yeah, sir. and I might add um, that part of the, the burden here falls directly on council. So if you look at the land use plan, which I know you have, there are no less than 70 recommendations. They're all prioritized. And I dare say we probably only followed up on 10 or 15% of them. And we have also deviated somewhat markedly from the original land use plan. So if these are foundational documents, public engagement's critical, but the other side of that is council really needs to own them and follow up on them and use them as, as the, the gauge against which all things are judged. Do we, have a, do we have a maximum amount in the budget that we've agreed to or are we just waiting for the RFPs to come back? The town budget is $125,000. And I assume that's sufficient. I mean, that's the going rate, right? Uh, yeah, it's towards the middle. When we I surveyed a bunch of other uh, jurisdictions okay. to see what they spent, uh, it's towards the middle of the costs that we got back. Okay, yeah. so it's comparison based. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Any other questions? Is there a motion? Motion to approve the request for proposals as drafted. Second. That's you. Second. <laughs> Third. Don't fight over it. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. With that, um, we go to closed session. I'll make a motion to go to closed session to consult with the town attorney <coughs> to preserve the attorney client privilege and to discuss specific personnel pursuant to NC General Statute 143, 318, 11A, 3 and 6. Second. I'm sorry, I missed that one. <laughs> it's unanimous. Like done that before. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <sighs> That's what that room looks like when nobody's in it. We're back from closed section. Um, from closed session, excuse me, and uh, no action was taken. Do we have a motion to adjourn? I'll make that motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Thank you very much. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>